the viral video that shamed the Indian authorities and media outlets into finally paying attention to an important story. Israelis are describing the fight over judicial reform at the expense of democracy as a looming civil war. And from outer space to your screens, satellite images in the news. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and analyze how news gets reported. Sometimes one video goes viral and puts a news story on the map. That is what happened late last week in the northeastern Indian state of Manipur. The video revealed a shocking case of sexual assault, a gang rape that was condemned, eventually, by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The added twist to this story turns out the attack happened more than two and a half months ago, during ongoing unrest in the state that the mainstream news media have paid scant attention to. There's also an internet shutdown in place in Manipur that has had a suppressing effect on both journalism and freedom of expression there. This conflict is between two ethnic communities, the majority Hindu Métis and the Kukis, a mainly Christian minority. Prime Minister Modi and the state government aligned with his party, the BJP, are accused of failing to prevent the violence and of fomenting negative stereotypes about the Kukis. That video that went viral, it showed Métis men assaulting Kuki women. Broadcast journalists are trained to start their reports with the most compelling video images they have, pictures that capture audiences by conveying the essence of the story. In this case, that is not something we could do. The video that went out on Indian social media of two women stripped naked, being assaulted and paraded by a mob that would rape them was so disturbing, so brutal, it cannot be shown. The descriptions of it are difficult enough. It's broad daylight. There are two women towards the right of the frame. They are bare, naked. There are a lot of men surrounding them, 800 to 1,000, some of them brandishing sticks. Some of the men are in close proximity to the women. They are groping them publicly, touching their private parts. Whatever anybody sees in that frame is shocking, galling. Can you imagine a group of about 800 people were parading these two women? And who handed these two women over to the mob? The police. And we are, I'm glad that the whole world and this nation are now baying for blood. The footage was first posted on social media on July 19th, but was actually shot two and a half months before in early May. There has been fighting in the northeastern state of Manipur throughout that period, but only limited information available, partly because of a government-imposed internet shutdown. Such blackouts are common in India, usually imposed when communal or political tensions boil over. Most of the people in Manipur are Métis. They practice a form of Hinduism. Kukis, the minority group, are Christian and live in many states in India's northeast. Some have roots in neighboring Myanmar, where a military coup in 2021 resulted in a surge of refugees crossing into India. Manipur has become the site of a power struggle between Métis living in the valleys and Kukis in the hills. Religion doesn't have that much to do with it. It's more about bloodlines, ethnicity, resources, jobs. The fault line in this case is ethnic. It's more tribal than religious. Religion is an undertone to the conflict. It is not the dominant thing. And I wrote in Foreign Policy's editor came back to me and said, can I make it Hindu-Christian? I said, no, it's not Hindu-Christian. The dominant divide is the divide between Metis and Kukis. The problem with this conflict is that the two communities are completely divided now. The Metis who live in the valley and the Kukis who live in the hills. This is more a conflict about resources. This is more about a conflict of the Métis 
really wanting their tribe status. It would mean that they would enjoy the same rights as the tribals. They would get access to all employment, all jobs, all uh, facilities that the tribals get. And that, that is the conflicting point. For a long period of time, the cookies, who have very strong kinship bonds with tribes in Myanmar, have been uncomfortable with the discourse. The discourse has been that you are not from Manipur, you are migrants, refugees, etc. In Manipur, they have faced a BJP-led government, uh, which has been aggressive, which has almost targeted a community uh, consistently. Did the internet blockade have anything to do with the timing of the release? Was it to escalate the conflict? Was it to pause the conflict? All of these questions haven't been answered completely. No country shuts down the internet as often as India does. When trouble strikes, the authorities routinely black out the regions affected. According to Human Rights Watch, between 2020 and 2022, shutdowns were imposed 127 times, including a 4G blackout in Jammu and Kashmir that lasted a year and a half. The Manipur shutdown was ordered by the head of the state government, who is with the BJP, the same party Prime Minister Narendra Modi leads nationally. Shutting down the internet, even temporarily, can lower the political temperature by limiting misinformation and the influence bad actors have on the discourse. But for journalists, shutdowns are a cure that can be worse than the disease. It is hard enough to report on a remote region like Manipur without losing a primary communications tool. India is the internet shutdown capital of the world. And the excuse that the government of Manipur has used is that this is the only way they can prevent violence in the state. Hundreds of cases, similar cases, have been India's courts has very clearly said that the government should open at least limited internet and so that even if social media platforms are kept shut, other avenues, whether for education, whether for government services, etc., can be, can be availed by the people. Uh, but the state government has not exceeded so far. The people in Manipur itself are, are you know, well aware of what is happening. Uh, so it's hardly a secret to them. Uh, of course, uh, seeing it might inflame passions elsewhere. But to block the internet for an entire state for two and a half months is rather extreme and the government should have found other ways of dealing with the situation. Throughout the months of ethnic fighting, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had not uttered a word. The day after that video went viral, he finally acknowledged publicly what was happening in Manipur. मणिपुर की जो घटना सामने आई है किसी भी सर्व समाज के लिए ये शर्मसार करने वाली घटना है Modi spent a total of 30 seconds on the subject. He did not refer to the BJP state government's handling of the dispute. The larger, overriding issue limiting the coverage of regional developments like those in Manipur is the national media's lack of interest in stories outside of major cities. Indian news channels spend far too much time in their studios in New Delhi and Bombay concocting shouty debates designed to boost ratings. Between the distance required to travel and the fact that regional stories often fail to attract national audiences, important socio-political issues usually go uncovered. Stories like farmers who cannot make ends meet, inadequate healthcare systems, the lack of safe water supplies in rural areas. Money poor is treated as newsworthy now because of the video that went viral. Because it is a disservice to our country to ignore what happened in the state. But that ugly assault on kooky women is not what set off this dispute. It was a symptom of what has been unfolding in the Northeast for months and had not been getting nearly enough attention.
mainstream media's coverage of Manipur in particular and the Northeast in general has been historically dismal. There was enough material for the media to make a decision that, hey, this is worthy of covering, this is worthy of our time, this needs investigation, let's go there. Obviously, it's not a comfortable story, so they're going to face these impediments, but there are ways and means around it. This is more a question of intent than impediment. Well, the mainstream media in India has, has sold out more or less completely especially the television media. They cannot be taken seriously anymore. They are propagandists and uh, all they do is try and uh, make uh, the BJP and Mr. Modi look good all the time. But in this case, after the emergence of the video, it has been a little awkward for them. So some of them have had to shift positions and at least temporarily seem to be uh, doing what they are more or less supposed to do, which is speak up for the people who have been uh, violated. Please see the coverage that has been done by new media. An amazing number of young women are currently in Manipur covering the story, have been covering it right since the outbreak of the violence, picking out the nuances, uh, talking to survivors, making those connections of uh, the police not acting enough. And their work has really added to our understanding of what fake information did and how it sparked the violence. And they are continuing to cover it today. We can't allow large parts of this country to be complete sort of news islands and never cover them. The Israeli government succeeded this past week in passing part of a sweeping plan to weaken the role the judges play, giving more power to politicians. Changes that protesters say bring the country one giant step closer to a dictatorship. Tarek Nafa has been following the coverage of this story. Richard, this law concentrates even more power in the hands of Israel's far-right government. With tensions rising this past Monday, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed Israelis during prime time, calling for national unity and dialogue. As he spoke, a split screen on Channel 13 showed police unleashing a water cannon on protesters. There were chaotic scenes on the streets, a level of police force usually reserved for Palestinians. The morning after the vote, Israeli newspapers printed blacked-out front pages, ads paid for by the protest movement announcing the death of Israel's democracy. One term that has crept into the coverage is civil war. We're hearing it from journalists, commentators and politicians, among them former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. This is the first time that the government of Israel declared war on the people of Israel. Olmert's comments inadvertently get at the contradiction at the heart of these protests. Palestinians living under military occupation say Israel declared war on them long ago. Israel's democracy, they say, exists for Jews only. That double standard was evident on Tuesday when government and opposition politicians set aside their differences over judicial reform, coming together to vote in favour of expanding a discriminatory law, one that will make it easier to prevent Palestinian citizens moving to Jewish towns. How much media coverage did that vote get? Very little. In Israel, there tends to be consensus when the laws being passed are anti-Palestinian. Thanks, Tarek. From Ukraine to Afghanistan to Xinjiang, China, satellite imaging is playing a central role in how conflicts and human rights abuses are tracked and reported. It has empowered journalists and researchers to conduct vital investigations and debunk misinformation in real time, all without risking any lives on the ground. And cameras in orbit are a booming industry, with the onset of Russia's invasion of Ukraine shares in the biggest geospatial imaging company started to spike. But this is an emergent technology that comes with an implicit bias. American and Western governments are the primary clients of those companies, which means that they have a say over where in the world they can and cannot Take pictures. The Listening Post's Ahmed Mahdi now on the bigger picture and the finer details of the satellite companies providing news coverage from space. From the buildup of forces along the border. The Russian military convoy getting closer to Russian troops the near the Ukraine border. 
to the outbreak of war. Interesting to see if the Russians move up from the south. To allegations of human rights abuses and war crimes. Bodies lying in the streets before Russian troops withdrew. The civilian bodies were left lying dead for weeks. Audiences around the world have seen the Russia-Ukraine conflict unfold almost in real time. Not from the ground, but from space. Satellite imagery firstly provides a different angle. You're looking at it from above. So you're seeing something very different to what you would see from street level or from uh, a human height. But more importantly, you're gathering data over such a large area that would just not be practically possible for uh, a traditional journalist. It enables you to have access to imagery that is taken perhaps every day or every week of everywhere on Earth. And that is hugely powerful for telling stories. Satellite imagery has been used historically to document a variety of um, atrocities and human rights abuses. We saw an important example of this when Secretary of State Madeleine Albright released satellite images of alleged mass graves during the war in Bosnia. There was the UN Security Council presentation by Colin Powell before the US went to war against Iraq and the use of satellite images of alleged weapons of mass destruction. And there were all kinds of controversies, of course, uh, related to that. So this is not a new practice, but because we're seeing so many news media outlets use these images now, it there's a, seems to be a novelty associated with it. One of the companies that has benefited the most from that novelty is US-based satellite company Maxar Technologies. The American satellite intelligence company Maxar. Maxar satellite images. These images, which were produced by Maxar Technology on the 19th of March. Whether it's natural disasters, mass demonstrations, or collaborating with the BBC on an investigation into human rights abuses in Cameroon, Maxar have led the way in introducing the satellite image to the news media. That all came in handy when the Ukraine war broke out and the company was poised to take advantage of the media interest. Maxar has become a stock turnaround story. It's up some 175% over the past year. Maxar has somewhat become a household name. An earlier image from Maxar Technologies shows one of those same Russian ships. In, a in the past, much of the imagery that they provided was done on a fairly ad hoc basis, but in recent years, they actually formalized their news bureau to more uh, coherently share not only imagery, but in-depth analytics uh, with the news media. You know, that is all pro bono work for them. There is no revenue model around working with the media. The earth observation industry in general, whether you're talking about Maxar here in the US, Airbus uh, in France and Europe, and ImageSat International in Israel generates about 80% of its revenues from government, defense, and intelligence customers. Most of the world's major satellite companies actually began life in the military and intelligence services. It wasn't too long ago that satellite imaging was the sole preserve of states. And as the Cold War thawed, many began to offload the huge expense and financial risk of operating these satellites to the private sector. In the US, for example, President Bill Clinton passed a law in the early 90s opening up the use of satellite imaging to private industry. And out of that comes many of today's top geospatial imaging companies. Names like Planet Logic, Black Sky, and of course, Maxar. And to this day, the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. The Department of Defense and Intelligence Agencies in the United States, they're the primary contractors and they get up to 80% of their satellite image data from these private companies. The federal government has also subsidized a lot of the development of these satellites. They're in, they, they are hand in glove, in a sense. In the case of a situation like uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, it's pretty common to see uh, Russian troop movements, but you know I have yet to see a single image of Ukrainian troop movements. Now that, is that a uh, conscious decision on the part of these companies to withhold that, or is there a government requirement to withhold what could be damaging you know, tactical information on U.S. allies? And it's probably a combination of the both. We need to always be asking, every time we see a satellite image in the news, what is being shown? What does the caption say? Who put the arrows and the circles 
into the graphic field of that image and what is being argued on the basis of that image. Who generated the satellite image? The answer is, whoever has the money. Here's how it works. Firstly, you have to launch the satellite into space, and then you have to position it over where in the world you want to image. That's called tasking, and it's expensive, very expensive. Something only the seriously big players like governments and mega corporations can afford. But once the satellite is in position, the market opens up and some of the images it takes can be bought and sold for a more reasonable price or even shared for free. And that's helped open source journalists, people who investigate stories based on publicly available data to take advantage of satellite imagery to power their reporting. So thinking back to January this year, there were all of these reports in the media about Russia building up troops on the border with Ukraine. So we speculated that if an invasion was imminent, these troops would assemble in smaller staging areas closer to the border. In order to work out whether this was happening, I created maps or images, let's say, of data taken from a European Space Agency satellite. Their data is generally all freely available. However, this imagery was in very low resolution. All I could see was effectively just a series of blobs. Then what uh, we went ahead and did was order uh, high resolution imagery of that location that was suspicious. And it turned out that in fact, yes, there was a Russian base uh, that was being built up relatively closer to the border with Ukraine. At the same time, there were many other people who were tracking TikTok posts of very much similar things. And it all just sort of builds together and forms a more concrete proof of what is going on. As far as the news media is concerned, satellite imagery is still an emerging technology. And like most new tech, drones, social media, the internet, it can often hide an implicit bias, illuminating our view of some stories whilst quietly diverting our attention away from others. And its origins as a means of state-sponsored surveillance should really make us ask questions not only about what the satellite sees, but what it overlooks. Satellite imagery is often classified as a surveillance technology. I think that is a misconception. Just because it so happened that uh, it was first born out of uh, the military industrial complex doesn't necessarily mean that it can't have massive positive impacts across a whole number of fields, whether it's predicting or monitoring the impact of droughts and climate change, whether it's monitoring infrastructure, for damage and very quickly responding, whether it's a disaster response. Uh, th there are many, many different kinds of applications outside of defense. And I think what we're seeing right now is that there's uh, a growing recognition of this. It's being integrated more and more into our news media landscape. And it is having impacts on us as consumers, as citizens. It, it can involve us in a sense of having the power to patrol and monitor events across the planet. And the satellite has an aesthetic that makes us feel like we can see and know anything at the push of a button. And it's just, that's not a reality. It's really important that we have journalists and the public trained to use and read satellite images and to be able to have critical media literacy around them. And finally, what kind of picture would satellite imagery paint of our planet this past week and the accelerating effects of climate change? Those space-based cameras can see wildfires encircling the Mediterranean and unstable weather systems that are simultaneously hitting countries like Italy with record-breaking temperatures, hailstorms, and floods. They could zoom in on the havoc and destruction across South Asia and other parts of the globe. We're going to leave you now with some on-the-ground coverage, pictures taken by photojournalists working on the front lines of the climate change story. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.